The consumer pays, but who's to blame for, mo for monopolies? To answer that question, we have to understand uh, what we mean by the term monopoly. <clears throat> Promiscuous use of the word monopoly uh, has rendered the meaning of the word uh, very confusing and for example, people run around and say big firms are monopolies, banks are monopolies, competitive grocery firms are, are monopolies. Everybody's a monopoly. In despair, one American economist, uh, Paul Heine, who has a leading textbook in, in economic principles, has abandoned the use of the word. Well, I think it's probably better to try to clarify uh, what we mean by monopoly rather than to, to give up the use uh, of the word. And I think the way to clarify the meaning is to distinguish between two different forms of monopoly, two different types of monopoly, statutory monopoly and market share monopoly. A statutory monopoly means a firm or group of firms that is protected from competition by statute, by the state. Okay, include uh, examples of statutory monopolies uh, I will, will be giving, given, but um, we should just note here that frequently government-owned firms are statutory monopolies, and we'll look, look at examples of those. Okay, the second meaning of monopoly, market share monopoly, a firm or group of firms that has a large share of the market, but no, no legal protection against competition. Okay, it's my argument in this paper that if consumer groups are to be effective, they should be criticizing statutory monopolies and not market share monopolies. Because statutory monopolies, by definition, have legal protection against competition, therefore they are free to raise prices. Market share monopolies, on, other hand, on the other hand, they may have a large share of the, of the market, but they face the threat of competition, the threat of entry of new firms, and therefore have much less monopoly power than do statutory monopolies. Okay, let me first um, talk then about statutory monopolies. Uh, the word monopoly itself originally comes from two Greek words meaning single and selling rights. So in other words, the original classical meaning of monopoly is a single seller with exclusive rights of sale. Okay, in other words, a statutory monopoly. This has been the meaning of monopoly throughout history. For example, Queen Elizabeth I gave Sir Walter Raleigh the exclusive right to sell playing cards. Uh, the famous East India Company had a monopoly uh, to sell tea to the American uh, colonies. And the French state retained a monopoly in salt. Okay, the, this classical meaning, uh, the classical meaning of monopoly, uh, statutory monopoly, survives today uh, in the form of utilities, which are given um, uh, legal monopolies by the state. For example, telephone, gas, electricity, and water. Or the state itself retains monopolies frequently in telephone and postal service, railroads, radio and TV. We have, of course, good examples in South Africa today. <coughs> if, we, if we look at the top 10 non-financial firms in South Africa, uh, as given in a recent issue of the Financial Mail, 
of, of change their rankings by excluding financial corporations because uh, I'm interested in just the non-financial firms, that's where the real assets of the economy uh, are being held. And so if we look at the top ten firms on this basis, when we look at the top ten firms, uh, the top ten non-financial firms in South Africa today, we see <coughs> that there are four state-owned enterprises in the top ten, and that the leading firm in the, the largest firm in South Africa, contrary maybe to uh, popular opinion, is not Anglo-American, but it's ESCOM. And we see ESCOM's number one, um, SAT, South African Transportation System, is number three, and the post office is number six. And at least those three, uh, we can are certainly classified as statutory monopolies. They have legal protection against competition. And my argument uh, that I want to develop is that we have more to fear from uh, the statutory monopoly ESCOM or, or SATS or the post office than we do from um, Anglo-American or, or any other large firm uh, in the economy. Okay, uh, an important point that I would now like to, to uh, discuss is that if we take this classical idea of statutory monopoly, it means not, it, it, we, we don't have to restrict the idea of statutory monopoly to a single firm because the, what the classical idea of monopoly says is that it's legal restrictions on competition that determine monop a monopoly power and not the fact that it is a single seller. And so we can expand the definition of statutory monopoly to include any firm that can raise its price because of legal protection against the ability of others to compete. And now uh, let me give some examples. And I think these examples will bring home the point that we should be concerned about statutory monopolies and not market share monopolies. For example, tariffs. Industries that are protected from tariffs If industries are protected from tariffs and are able to raise prices, that means they're statutory monopolies. The, the tariffs protect them from competition and they are thereby able to raise prices. For example, if the TV firms, the firms manufacturing uh, televisions in South Africa are protected by tariffs from foreign TV firms, then they are statutory monopolies. Another good example would be agricultural marketing boards. By means of agricultural marketing boards, thousands of farmers are able to restrict competition and thereby raise the price of food. And that's an issue that's already been raised in this, in this conference. So the point is, you don't need a single firm to have a statutory monopoly. You can have thousands of firms that still have a statutory monopoly if you have restrictions on competition. Another good example is to compare the KWV with South African breweries. The KWV has statutory control over thousands of farmers. And, there, and, and through that statutory control can legally fix a minimum price uh, or, and supervise a quota system that restricts wine output and therefore raises prices. So, uh, in contrast, South African breweries 
They may have 99.9% of the malt beer market, but they, but they have no statutory protection from com competition. So why does uh, South African breweries have 100% have, uh, of the market almost in South Africa? Well, uh, for many products, it's more efficient to produce in large volumes. And if we look at the American market, a very few beer firms dominate the American market, which is, of course, a much larger market. So it shouldn't be too surprising that one producer can dominate the much smaller market of South Africa. But the point is that he may control 99.9% .9 of the market, but has no legal protection. Therefore, the South African breweries is much less to be feared than a contrived monopoly like the KWV with its statutory right to stifle competition. Another good example of statutory monopoly where you have thousands of firms is the licensing of occupations. The licensing of occupations is a particularly uh, strong form of statutory monopoly because they typically restrict entry of new individuals, new firms into the market and Number two, they stifle competition among existing firms. A famous example in the U.S. is the American Medical Association. Can the American Med Medical Association restricts the entry of new, new doctors into the field by controlling the accreditation of medical schools. And number two, they restrict competition among doctors by denying them access, or having the power to deny them access to surgical hospitals if they misbehave. For example, if doctors uh, behave unethically by advertising, or at least what the AMA calls unethical, then they, they use this power to to uh, deny them access to hospitals and therefore enforce their restrictions on competition. In the state of California, there are over 40 licensing boards that regulate various occupations. Some existing licensing boards, the Auctioneers Commission, the Barbers Board, the Cosmetologists Board, the Cemetery Board, the Funeral Directors Board, the Board of Fabric Care, that's for dry cleaners, the Board of Landscape Architects, the Board of Geolo Geolo Geologists and Geophysicists, the Certified Shorthand Reporters Board. <laughs> Other occupations seeking licensing Electronic reporters, interior designers, sports agents, ticket agents, travel agencies, recreational therapists, and estheticians. I haven't quite figured out who they are yet, but they want to be licensed. As somebody put it very well, these groups have been pounding the doors of government seeking for their own occupations, the privileged, privileged status that only a license can bring. Now, even if you think a doctor should be licensed, you might have doubts about the public benefit of the Board of Fabric Care, Care in California or the Bicycle Assembly Control Committee in Pretoria. As a state senator in California put it, in theory, the only reason why the state should license anyone is when it's a matter of public protection. 
that's clearly the case in medicine, then it's downhill from there. I find the case for public protection in the area of dry cleaning underwhelming. <laughs> well, I, I disagree with the senator that you should even license uh, uh, doctors, but I certainly agree with him that it's downhill from there. Another good example of the of statutory monopoly, which uh, again brings out the contrast between uh, the, or brings out the importance of legal restrictions versus market share or number of firms, is the U.S. quota system on Japanese car imports. This was instituted in the early 1980s. The U.S. Uh, restricted the Japanese cars coming into the U.S. to a certain amount, certain quotas. What happened was the price of Japanese cars rose by $3,000, which is a lot of rands. In any, in any currency, it's a lot of money. Consequently, since Japanese car prices went up, uh, American car prices went up as well. And it's even so Detroit, the Detroit manufacturers uh, benefited from this quota system on Japanese car imports. But interestingly, the Japanese car manufacturers also benefit, benefited. Because what it did was the quota system restricted competition in the U.S. among Japanese car producers. And therefore, they benefited as well as did American manufacturers. And so, what so what's the uh, what's the lesson here? The lesson is, you had a very few firms do uh, dominating the American market. You had four major U.S. firms. You had a few Japanese firms, but they couldn't raise the price by three thousand dollars. But the quota system pro imposed by the government brought about that price increase. So it's again, it's a legal restriction that causes uh, rises in prices. Uh, <clears throat> I would now like to look at some evidence of the difference between statutory and market share monopolies in terms of price increases. Economists uh, differ on the, in the effect of market share monopolies on prices. Some economists think that uh, market share monopolies will be able to raise prices to some extent. Other economists think that uh, market share monopolies or the concentration of industry simply reflects uh, efficiencies, cost efficiencies. For example, the, for example, the economies of scale that determines the structure of the beer industry uh, that I mentioned. The point I want to make here is that even those economists who think that market share monopolies can raise prices understand that their ability to raise prices is very limited because of the threat of com competing firms entering and taking away their business. For example, one such economist, Oliver Williamson, says an increase of well less than 10% is probably to be expected. And another economist, Richard Posner, he looked at the great electrical conspiracy. The great electrical conspiracy was a famous conspiracy between the manufacturers of electrical equipment who colluded to raise prices that they sold to public utilities. Even this famous conspiracy, so famous it's called the Great Conspiracy, was able to raise prices by less than 10%. That's the effect of market share monopolies. What is the evidence for the effect of prices on statutory monopolies? Uh, 
the same Richard Posner summarizes the results for the U.S. Physician services, we've already talked about the a statutory monopoly, the American Medical Association, estimated to have risen, uh, raised prices by, by 40%. And all the rest of those products uh, represent industries which were regulated uh, by a federal agents, agency and uh, thereby restricting competition and we see the resulting rise in prices. The airlines represents a particularly uh, notorious example. Uh, the airlines were regulated by a federal agency known as the Civil Aeronautics Board, or CAB, from 1938 to 1978. During this 40-year period, the Civil Aeronautics Board functioned as an enforcer of a cartel, or a statutory monopoly. By number one, in this 40-year period, they didn't allow any new airlines to enter the industry, and number two, they restricted competition among existing airlines by uh, setting fares, fixing fares, and restricting the number of airlines that could serve particular routes. And uh, an interesting comparison can be made because as a federal agency, the CAB was not able to regulate airlines that, fl that flew or had routes be within a state. So, for example, if you look at the state of California, you compare the route from Los Angeles to San Francisco with a route from Boston to Washington, D.C. The CAB could not regulate that route in California because it was within a state. The fares were twice as high on the Boston-Washington, D.C. route as they were on the uh, L.A.-San Francisco route. Uh, similarly, a comparison of the New York, the New York, Washington D.C. route with the Houston, Dallas route within the state of Texas give, gives us the same results. The fares were twice as high on the New York, Washington D.C. route as they were on the Dallas, Houston route. Uh, in conclusion, I simply sh I must say that I think consumer groups should recognize that it is statutory monopolies. That, that have the power to raise prices, as given by this evidence. And the ability of market share monopolies to raise prices is very much uh, less, and maybe uh, some economists think it's zero, but in any case, it's a very small amount, much less than for statutory monopolies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Leach. Now, have we got some questions to give to Mr. Leach? Can you hear me? Is this working? Yes. No, I don't think the people at the back will hear you. I'm sorry. Well, you could repeat the question. The high cost of technology is that not keeping the smaller man out? You take the paper industry in South Africa. The cost of importing that very expensive machinery precludes smaller people from entering the market. Did yeah. you hear that at the back, or would you like to repeat it? No, I'll repeat the question. The question is, is the are tariffs on the importation of technology into South Africa, are they impeding the ability of the small guy to, to produce? And I would answer, certainly, that's uh, the answer is yes, because, as I said, a tariff that protects any industry uh, makes that industry, to that extent, a statutory monopoly. And uh, what we want is to allow foreign firms to sell their products here or to sell sell their technology to allow other people here to compete. Uh, 
Uh, good afternoon, Peter Carney, Mayor's Board. <laughs> I must say that uh, this has been a very interesting session. Uh, I've never seen so many businessmen riding white charges to the defense of the, the consumer in my life before. <laughs> very interesting. Uh, the point I really want to make, and the question I want to ask is, is simply this, that uh, the premise of this talk is that the, the, the business or the uh, monopoly, business monopoly is less dangerous than the statutory monopoly. But if you really look at the situation and you look at who the master is that businessmen serve, particularly the large corporate businessmen, business organization. That is the shareholder. Make no mistake, at the end of the day, it's the shareholder. And if you look at the stat, the power that these big corporations have, and if we take the situation with SA Breweries, they, Louis Lake tried to come into that business uh, from Triumph. He was efficiently pushed out. He never had a chance. And uh, in that type of situation, that type of commodity, there is far more power in terms of what the businessman has than is the case in the, with the statutory organization, and now talking about the marketing boards, because it, with the marketing boards, we do face direct competition from other foodstuffs in the first place, and secondly, the consumer is represented on the board. The consumer has also got a right of appeal through the Marketing Act to the Minister of Agriculture, I don't think there's one consumer on the board of SA Breweries. So I, I really challenge the premise. Thank you. Mr. Carney, you're not, you're not asking a question. Uh, I'll respond to that anyway. Um. <laughs> not too long. <laughs> okay, the, uh, what is the point of having a, uh, a statutory uh, right to restrict competition, which hurts consumers, and then giving consumers uh, place on the board to offset that, just forget about it in the first place. Don't have it in the first place, and you don't have to worry about consumers on your boards. I've got something in writing. I've been asked, what is a cartel? To what extent are the financial institutions, the oil companies in South Africa, cartels? Okay. <coughs> The question is, uh, what is a cartel? That's the first question. A cartel is just a statutory monopoly. As, I, as I've defined, it includes, stat, uh, it's included in my definition of statutory monopoly uh, because I gave examples where there are thousands of, of firms or individuals in an industry protected by, uh, by the state from competition. So the KWV, for example, is a cartel of, of wine farmers. Um, the other question was, what, to what extent is, uh, are the financial institutions uh, a cartel? To what extent stand out the financial institutions and the oil companies, uh, are they cartels? Okay, the answer again is, the, to the extent that they're protected uh, by the state uh, from competing amongst each other or from competition of other firms, to that extent they would be uh, cartels and you, and you would have to look at the laws governing the financial institutions and the oil companies to make that determination. I would say financial institutions are protected uh, to some extent by the state but that is, it's my impression the oil companies uh, are not. But the final answer depends on what the law is, what the legal restrictions are. Okay, of course, the petrol, price of petrol is controlled here. Um, so I guess the answer is yes for oil companies. Take one more question, please. <coughs> Madam Chair, I know you don't like observations, so I'll put it as an observation and ask for a response from it. It's, it's my belief that most of our so-called market share 
monopolies here rely very heavily on a statutory monopoly in an associated business. We've, one of the examples that's come up is the, is the breweries one. Um, there, bottle stores are very tightly controlled licenses under statutory system. The wine industry, as we've heard with the KWV, <coughs> licensing of hotels. And anybody who was around at the time when Louis Late had a go at that market, and later on when Rembrandt had a go, and before when Whitbread had a go, will realize that the way in which South African breweries was able to defeat them was by squeezing them out of the bottle stores. Having, they virtually said to the bottle store, if you take their beer, uh, you pay a higher price for ours. And I believe that goes further than that. That I believe that if you look at something like um, the glass industry here, the bottle industry, that because we've got tight legislation in the bottle stores, we end up with a monopoly in the beer industry. Because we've got a monopoly in the beer industry, we end up with only one company making the bottles. So I, I would submit that nearly all of these market share monopolies are in fact uh, indirectly attributable to the fact that there's a statutory monopoly somewhere else. I wonder if Mr. Leach would respond to that. Say, so has he evidence of that sort of thing? Would he agree with the premise? Thank you. Could you just identify yourself, please? Sorry, my name's Simon Fisk. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, well, I would certainly agree that uh, restrictive licensing at the retail level, um, that's a statutory monopoly to the extent that, to which it affects uh, the market share of South African breweries. I, I am not sure. I have my doubts. I think that the economies of scale in brewing, as evidenced by the U.S. Uh, market, uh, simply dictate that you're going to have uh, one firm dominating the market. Uh, but the only way to really find out is to, to uh, I mean, I would argue you should re remove those licensing restrictions at the retail level and uh, see what the market tells us. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, we won't have any more questions. And as we are running late now, we will have lunch till 13.45 when we will return to the hall. Thank you very much indeed. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I think we've all had a very pleasant lunch, although it was informal. It gave us an opportunity to chat to everybody else. Um, I think what we, is necessary to point out is that uh, for those people who are not familiar with consumer organizations in South Africa, that this is perhaps the first time that the four voluntary consumer organizations have come together in a conference like this uh, under the auspices of the Free Market Foundation of South Africa to uh, debate uh, matters of common concern. So it might seem very strange to certain people attending the conference the way we're doing it, but it is for us extremely valuable that we get to know each other because we work in the same fields, although in a vi very diverse way. Then introducing the agricultural debate this afternoon, I would just like to say something very interesting, that this very morning, in Pretoria, where the Transvaal Agricultural Conference, Agricultural Union Conference is taking place, they are debating very much a parallel issue. And it wasn't planned this way, but it is important to note that there is uh, a lot of thought being given to agriculture and the future of agriculture in South Africa. And then it leads me then to introduce the speakers that we have here today. The first speaker would be Mr. Isaac Kronier. I will introduce him now. Mr. Sam Lawson Yani, unfortunately, was taken into hospital last night. He will not be speaking here today. And Joe Mutuna has been kindly consented to take part in the um, seminar this afternoon. And then, uh, of course, lastly, we will have Simon Fisk to participate. Um, I will change the pattern a little today, this afternoon's session. I'm going to give each speaker a 20-minute slot to uh, argue his uh, particular point or state it as we have uh, debated, uh, stated it on the program. 
And then at the end, please write down your questions as they speak. And then we have a little broader, um, more time than in the end to ask the questions. <coughs> and I hope it will then be a very fruitful afternoon. Now, our first speaker today is uh, Isaac Cronier. He is the president of the Free State Agriculture Union, and he will be speaking on reconciling the interest of consumers and farmers. Now, Isaac Cronier holds a BSDC degree in biochemistry from the University of Pretoria and has been farming since 1960 in Filjunskroen, and you can guess he is a maize farmer. Many of his, among his many offices in organizations throughout South Africa, is a member of the National Council for Population Development and a member of the Provincial Educational Council of the Orange Free State. His topic, of course, is reconciling the interests of consumers and farmers. Isaac. Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your friendly introduction. Looking purely at the heading of this paper, one's first thoughts are that to do justice to what the title requests, namely, to reconcile the interests of the consumer and farmer would be an impossible endeavor. The consumer may be dissatisfied with the price he has to pay for his daily nutritional needs, while the farmer may stress the point that he, on the other hand, finds it difficult to produce at current producer prices. Now, uh, when I mentioned this subject earlier to one of my friends, and I added that I would have to deliver a paper on it at this very illustrious meeting, I got a response somewhat like, well, I wish you luck facing all those consumer organizations and those profits of the free market concept. You as a producer will most probably find yourself as a pigeon among the cats. I, I think this idea was most probably or, originated by you, Madam Chair, when you re recruited me as a possible speaker with a suggestion that I should bring forward the viewpoint of the establishment, as you put it. Uh, I don't know whether you can still remember that. Now, to enhance the viewpoint of the establishment in itself, anyway, can already be a very arduous venture. Because it seems that the big guns are always out against it. It's not a very popular point to enhance. Nevertheless, I'm committed. And I suppose I wouldn't have been here, or I wouldn't have been farming, had I not had the rather silly inclination to face challenging times. Now, I don't necessarily agree, necessarily agree with my friend's remark, as I am of the opinion that the farmer and the consumer do have a lot of mutual interest that, that uh, has to be fostered in some way or other. Hence my appearance here today. Accusations are heard from time to time that the Marketing Act, with its different schemes, must be held responsible for the difficult situation in which the consumer and the farmer finds themselves, and I've heard that today. Another viewpoint on the subject will probably deny it emphatically and will place the origin of these problems somewhere else. Now, my argumentation must be seen against my farming background. I'm a farmer, I'm a plain common farmer. I am, however, prepared to maintain an open mind without losing touch with reality. And therefore, I want to start by contemplating the possible implications of a free market for all agricultural products. Now, firstly, let's look briefly at the different needs of the consumer and farm. It is obvious that the consumer will be looking for a constant supply of readily available foodstuffs at affordable prices. On the other hand, the farmer is in need of a constant demand for his product at the selling price that will leave him with a reasonable profit. Thus, both parties <coughs> depend on one another. From the outset, we must accept 
that markets for agricultural products differ considerably. Considerably. On the one hand, we have the reasonably free and open system for fresh produce, where supply and demand determine the fresh produce market prices. I suppose there are no arguments about, uh, against these arrangements. Milk is being produced and sold subject to very stringent health regulations. Now, consumers may protest against these if they are of opinion that these safety measures should not be applied and that they are prepared to risk an inevitable drop in quality. The farmer, on the other hand, must go to great lengths to comply with these standards. Red meat is sold, and I see my friends of the red meat uh, board is here today. Red meat is sold on the wholesale market on an open auction basis. But again, for health purposes, animals are being slaughtered under regulated conditions which necessitate expensive capital infrastructure. A considerable markup in price occurs when the product is offered at the various uh, retail outlets. Farmers have been asking for years now for a relaxation in these regulations. And although there is a difference of opinion about this, one can be certain that there is a considerable support amongst producers for a slackening of these measures. Again, a possible reduction in quality must be borne in mind. So the two important industries in the agricultural sector remain, namely the maize industry and the wheat industry. As both of them are of strategic nature and serve as a staple diet to a large part of our nation, they are also of importance here today. To be fair, let's look briefly at the consequences of a completely free and open market for maize as an example. And I'm a maize farmer, so I take this as an example. Due to the climatic conditions, the maize crop shows large fluctuations over long periods of time, which is also the case with the international coarse grain prices. At this, at this moment, these prices are at a very low level although there, there has been some improvement lately. The USA, however, which has an in international market share of 70% for maize, contributes largely towards the availability and consequently towards the overseas price of maize. Thus, a completely free domestic market for maize will depend largely on the overseas, the size of the international crop, as well as on the assistance policy for agriculture of governments in maize producing countries. That is very important. That is very important. Currently, the USDA, that's the United States Department of Agriculture, runs a very expensive, as I call it, farm bill. Uh, that means assistance to farmers, a very expensive farm bill, which lies far beyond the reach of the South African government. At current international price levels, a very limited number of producers, if any, if any, and I'm also a producer, will be able to produce commercially for such a market, which will make South Africa largely dependent on imports with a tremendous price increase and a significant drop in quality. And I don't know where you can still remember 1983 to 1985 when we imported maize from the USA. And uh, if you can still remember the quality, I also bought some of that, uh, some of that maize. And when I mulled it, it went up in dust. Uh, now, another point is, if white maize, and that's very important, because white maize for human consumption, if white maize of a good quality could be found in the international market in the first instance, consumers must state if this is what they want. Fluctuations in price, problems with availability, and as well as quality. And the people are looking into the maize marketing scheme at the moment. And if we feel that we are satisfied with, with these uh, uh, fluctuations in, or, or, or possible fluctuations in price, availability, quality, then we must say so. And I will, I will convey the message to the people. Let's look at it from the producer's point of view. And that's now from my point of view. Many farmers largely dependent on maize production, 
and hovering on the brink of financial disaster because of a series of harsh production seasons will fall by the wayside. And I'm not chasing up, uh, I'm not chasing up ghosts because I'm also a farmer and I'm in the same situation as a lot of, uh, of, of these uh, maize producers are. And I can vouch for that. This will have an adverse effect on the comprehensive farming community in rural areas, in, in rural areas, as well as on the economy. Now I'm asking, is this what we are opting for? And in this instance, I'm not talking about the farmers only. I'm also including the farm workers, dependent on the maize and the wheat industry for a lifestyle. I'm quite sure that we're looking at the vast number of people, all of them potentially capable of increasing the stream of migrators to towns and cities. This is the reality what we're facing. Now, at this moment there is considerable concern about the marketing schemes for maize as well as for wheat, and I've already said that. These are, being, these are presently being closely studied, and more flexible and less rigid marketing schemes are being sought. The main purpose of this is eventually to serve in the best interest of the producer as well as the consumer. Now the obvious question will be raised and that is why can't we have a grain market or a dom domestic grain market where the harvest could be offered to the highest bidder, as is the case with wool or in that of fresh produce. Now in the case of wool, we do not have an edible product and so for the lack of time reasons, let's leave it at that. I think a comparison with grain and cereals will most probably not be applicable. But let's look at fresh produce, vegetables. You can't import vegetables. And that's, look, that's one of the main important things. Because the, the, the international market has no influence on the vegetable, uh, vegetable production as well as on the consumption in South Africa which is not the case with maize and not the case with wheat. The situation for grain and cereal products is that these cannot be utilized by consumers in an unrefined form and therefore must be refined beforehand, which in turn calls for extensive capital infrastructure. This adds value as well as price to the product, but this is important what I'm now going to say, but the number of prospective buyers in this intermediate market is limited. Thus, opportunities for market manipulation increase significantly. What is happening at the moment? In the case of maize, the pr producer receives about 40 cents of the consumer rent. In other words, 60% of the maize price will be determined by the so-called free market, compared to the 40% contribution of the now so-called regulated market. In a totally free grain market, these limited number of participants will most probably have a supreme influence. Now, I'm not denying the possibility that an auction floor for grain and cereal may still be lying in the future because of the fact that the current marketing schemes are not supplying enough solutions to all the problems. And of course, bearing in mind the fact that we are living in a changing environment. Now, the case for, for wheat is more or less the same. Uh, my friends are here also from the Wheat Board, and uh, they also have this intermediate market of millers and bakers. Uh, in the case of wheat, we have a fixed price for bread and also a subsidy for uh, a government subsidy for bread, which is not the case with maize meal. I want to terminate my reasoning about markets at this, at, uh, this juncture because I can hardly do justice to the subject without also looking at the broad perspective of the African Agricultural Union strategic plan for the sound development of agriculture in South Africa. I want to look from this particular angle to bring you an update on how we as agriculturalists would like to see the industry develop. This strategy evolved over the past two years and came about as a result of and is aimed at implementing the report of the Economic Advisory Council of the State President regarding the reconstruction of agriculture. It also deals with the objectives of the white paper on uh, agricultural policy as well as an 
as uh, earlier resolutions and planning of the South African Agricultural Union. This plan, this plan is designed and constructed around the importance of the farmer as independent entrepreneur, while bearing in mind all the time the realities of affordability and feasibility. I think that one of the main aspects of the plan, and surely the one of greater importance here today, is that the agricultural sector is committed to market oriented production within the limits of climatic conditions. This had most certainly been one of the main criticisms against the farming sector, that it is not market oriented enough with the result that I, the produce prices on the one hand and overproduction on the other. I'll refer to this again. But I want to quote from the document to emphasize what I have just said, and I'm quoting from paragraph 11.5. It reads, market forces which already play a dominant role in agriculture should be allowed to work with a minimum degree of interference in order to encourage market oriented production. The unique characteristics of agriculture, however, dictate that a certain stability and the reduction of abnormally high risks in production and marketing processes be achieved by implementing the mechanisms available in terms of the Marketing Act and other relevant re legislation. Now, between brackets, I imagine some will not agree with this, the, especially the latter part. But I resume quoting from the document. In this process, a market-orientated approach must remain the point of departure. This is in our strategy. And then as a reality, agriculture can, however, not permit the influence of market forces to a degree greater than which the environment in which it operates internationally and domestically allows. I would also like to quote paragraph 11.6 from, <laughs> from the strategic plan, which I think is of great importance to the consumer. The primary requirement of any country is availability of adequate supplies of food and fiber of the desired quality. Supplying these from South Africa's own sources cannot take place at all costs. Not play, not, cannot take place at all costs. Yet a large degree of self-sufficiency is, is of particular importance to the RSA. In the quarterly review on agriculture, the Standard Bank commented during January this year in their leaflet agri-review, the agricultural industry traditionally sheltered from the effects of market forces is increasingly being exposed to the realities of supply and demand and 1989 is expected to see this trend escalate. Thus, the agricultural industry is not opposed to change towards less regulated marketing schemes and is prepared to let market forces work with less interference. The Marketing Act and the different schemes related to it should not necessarily be seen as the one and only obstacle towards more affordable food prices. As long as the Act is applied with the emphasis on marketing and which I think uh, all the boards are, are, are taking this on, uh, the, the emphasis on marketing and not on control, which wrongfully may have been the status quo in the past. I think the Act will work towards the benefit of the consumer at large and it will be conducive to provision of a steady supply of foodstuffs to the consumer at relative stable prices. It also provides the farmer with just enough assurance to be able to face the very harsh and unpredictable climate of South Africa. I just want to refer uh, very briefly to the possible influence of GATT. I must also be fair in this regard. Our Marketing Act may also have international trade implications and possibly complications for the RSA. The internationally placed body, the so-called Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, or GATT for short, is at this moment discussing the problem of liberalizing the trade in agricultural products. One of the main issues in question is the subsidizing of agricultural products by all governments, all industrialized governments. One of the points raised was that our Marketing Act is in its present form also being looked upon as a form of government assistance. This may have certain implications for, Afri for South Africa, should the point become a critical issue. South Africa, one of the contracting bodies to get and wanting to, rem to remain such, relying heavily on agricultural exports, would not want to see this opportunity be affected in a negative manner. 
In time to come, we may be compelled, compelled to consider the act against certain options. I want to, my last uh, topic, my last paragraph is a farmer as also as a consumer. The one aspect which makes the production of farming products increasingly difficult is the high rate of inflation. We've heard that already today. Where we are looking at the consumer price index on a yearly basis, something in the order of 15 to 16 percent. Our farming study group found the other day that the average price increase for just a few of the main production commodities for the period 1988-1989 to be in the order of 29,4 percent. This again must be seen against the possible possibility of a sharp drop in the producer price. And this brings me to my last thought. The farmer is always seen only as a producer. The one aspect which is being overlooked is that the farmer is also a consumer. Not only a consumer of production input commodities, but also a consumer of food, foodstuffs for human consumption, for livestock production. So the same problems which are being voiced by the general consumer are also being experienced by the farmer as a consumer. There are no farmers whom I'm aware of who are able to produce, produce all their food for their general needs. They must also rely on the local supermarkets to provide them for a, with a large portion of their daily consumption. The self-produced products that they do use for domestic consumption are not free of cost. They must value these at their potential selling prices. The higher these prices are, the higher the cost of living gets for the farmer himself. So, in conclusion, to conclude then, I'm convinced that there should be a healthy and constant relationship between consumers and producers. By maintaining such a relationship as we are trying to do today, a greater understanding will be brought about regarding the needs and purposes of these two different but very important groups in the economy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Isaac Cronier. Um, we will be asking questions um, after the presentations. Our next speaker is Joe Matuna. Uh, we are fortunate to have Joe here to speak to in Dr. Mutsunyani's place. Mr. Matuna joined NAFCOC on the 1st of August this year as Assistant Director for Educational Development and Research. His spheres of duty include research into training of entrepreneurs, coordination of NAFCOC activities, and liaising with training institutions for black entrepreneurs. He will speak on the topic, Freedom to Feed the Nation. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you'll appreciate that I come here in a representative capacity, and uh, the thoughts that I may give when I, I do not refer to the, the, the paper that uh, Dr. Tomsunyan gave me will be my personal thoughts. So if there's anything that you'd love to ask him that uh, really pertains to agriculture as he has experienced it, you would, uh, would appreciate it if you, uh, you direct it to NAFCOG. I find this very ironical in that I got to talk about agriculture when uh, I'm actually a township born. <laughs> and uh, also I find it very unfortunate that each time uh, a black is being required to deliver a paper or to make a speech, there is a bit of politicizing involved. If I may just uh, share this thought with you, whilst I was in the Free State, you know, <clears throat> we always refer to the Free State as one of the conservative uh, areas in the country. I must tell you that there are a few DP faces in the Free State. So this colleague of mine told me that uh, there is confusion that has been created by AWB and the CP. Uh, AWB wants the blacks to be driven into the sea, and the CP uh, does not want blacks on the beaches. So he says, how are they going to be driven into the, the sea because of this pre prevalent uh, problem? <clears throat> uh, 
Another thought I would like to share with you before I read uh, Dr. Mitsuyanyani's speech is that uh, it is amazing the ignorance that uh, prevails in our community, and in this case I'm referring to all uh, South Africans. Um, a, lot of, a lot of you may not know NAFCOG, I guess because uh, some of us don't read the relevant newspapers, some of you are not uh, exposed to the majority of the people of this country. In fact, if you find in the, in the work environment, if a, a black person sounds, does something which, to my mind, is common sense, you'd hear a white, leader, a white, uh, a white man saying, that was bust them, yeah? <coughs> <laughs> Meaning that you are, you're, you are of a different kind. So there is a lot of re-educationing to be done and de-educationing to be done in our community. Without much ado, I'm going to read uh, Dr. Mtsuanyani's speech. As you know, the topic is freedom to feed the nation. And it reads as follows. I regard it a great honor to have been invited to share some thoughts on a topic of great importance to the future of our country. Unfortunately, due to an unexpected illness, I'm unable to attend your conference, but however, feel persuaded to share some thoughts with conference on the subject assigned to me because for the, four, for the past 40 years I have had the fortune of being directly involved in the development of our culture in South Africa. The challenge of feeding the nation is one that goes far beyond our country and encompasses the whole of the African continent. At a conference held in Abidjan in August 1988, the development of agriculture was identified as the number, number one priority for Africa today. As regards the involvement of blacks in the production of agriculture, it is deeply regretted that they have been largely inhibited from playing a key role in this area. This is largely due to the laws such as the Land Act of 1913, which effectively confines the black people to 13% of the land area of South Africa. In fact, according to my information, only 10,9% of the land was allocated to blacks at that time. It was only after widespread protests by black leaders, which even went as far as London, when the Bimon Commission of Inquiry was required to investigate the whole equation of land distribution in South Africa. The commission reported its findings towards the end of 1918, and it was not until 1936 that its recommendations were implemented through the passing of the 1936 Land Act, which provided for an additional seven and a, and a quarter million morgan of what was then called the native areas of South Africa. With this additional land, the native areas would amount to approximately 13% of the land area of South Africa. One must concede that it was no easy matter for this additional land to be acquired and transferred to black farmers. It has taken more than 40 years for the government to acquire the seven, seven quarter million Morgan provided for in terms, in, in terms of the 1936 Land Act. I maintain that one of the most sensitive political issues of our time will be the transfer of land from white to black South Africans. Yet this is the development that cannot be avoided if justice is to be seen to be done in our country. For as long as I can remember, black people have been urging the South African government to, to give urgent attention to land distribution. In order to contain congestion that already exists in most of the black areas today, some bits and pieces of land have been added but nothing very significant. If blacks must one day be professional farmers, which they must be encouraged to become, there is need to open the Free State, the Cape, and large areas of Natal and the Transvaal for black occupation. For instance, many white farmers along the Limpopo River are completely deserted, whilst around these areas blacks are terribly overcrowded in what is called the native reserves. The opportunity for them to become large-scale producers is absolutely minimal. Our young people cannot be encouraged to undertake training in agriculture because it is perceived to be a dead-end profession under the present circumstances. One other aspect that needs urgent attention by authorities is the transformation of the existing land tenure system in the black areas. In most of the black so-called homeland areas, the prevailing system of land ownership is a communal system where individuals regardless of whatever improvements they effect, they do not derive the benefit that would entitle them to pledge their property as collateral for purposes of 
raising development capital. The people there have the right to use the land, but it does not belong to them, and this is the limiting factor of development. Through NAFCOC, our chamber has made repeated representations to the South African government and the homeland leaders with a view to persuading them to bring about reforms in the land tenure system as a means to providing more effective basis for commercial agriculture in black areas. But I'm sorry to say that so far there is very little, there is still, there are still farming on a subsistence, subsistence level. Only in a few areas in Buputetswana, the western part of the Traskai does one find farmers owning larger farms, where some profitable farming is evident. Earlier in the history of South Africa, and I'm witness to this fact, there were black farmers, and among them I include my own family, who own, who own big farms, but these were dispossessed by the government, and those farmers did extremely well as producers of food. I believe another matter that needs to be given serious attention in the promotion of profitable agriculture is the issue of financing of black farming ventures. When the Land Act was established in 1908, it was primarily designed to rehabilitate white farmers who were impoverished by the Anglo-Boer War. But the cause of the development of the black farmers were totally ignored, was totally ignored, sorry. Until the early 1940s, very little money had been spent by the government on the development of black farming. What was done initially was to spend money on rehabilitating areas that were devastated by soil erosion under the Betterment scheme. The white farmers organized themselves in organizations such as the White Farmers Agricultural Associations, and they totally ignored to assist or organize help for their black counterparts so that whatever benefits accrued from these associations were totally for the white farmers only. Government subsidies that came in the form of fencing, fertilizers, and equipment all went to the benefit of the white farmers. That being the case, I believe that the solution that would provide the essential freedom for blacks to participate fully in feeding our nation would lie in the following important factors redistribution of land to enable blacks to acquire sufficient land for agricultural purposes. The land act must be scrapped, for it is totally unacceptable and discriminatory. Technical training skills to be provided to, to the farmers and the black youth who have a de developed a negative attitude towards agriculture. This stress must be laid at an early age at our schools. Finance, adequate loans are to be extended to the black community, and long-term loans should also be made available. Water. Blacks must enjoy the existing facilities which have benefited white farmers so far. In fact, uh, we, I was chatting with Dr. Msunyani last night about the water affair. He said it is a, a natural resource, but uh, due to uh, reasons best known to you and I, a lot of, of the so-called black farmers have been deprived the uses of the uh, watering facilities that are available. Markets. Markets are to be uh, established within easy reach of the black farmers to enable them to market their produce. If the above factors were to be affected, we would have the following important factors. More food would be produced for the consumer, thereby diminishing the amount of starvation and hunger in the country. More work would be created for people in the rural areas. Greater food and wealth would be generated for the benefit of the country as a whole. I thank you. Thank you, Joe Matuna. That was doing very well, having read uh, Dr. Masanyani's uh, speech. Our next speaker is well known to many of you. He's an agricultural journalist, Simon Fisk was born in the United Kingdom. He has been involved in farming, agricultural journalism, and, the con and consultancy since he came to South Africa in the late 1960s. He was the first recipient of the Free Market Award for outstanding contribution to the cause of economic freedom in South Africa, and has twice won the JNB Award for Agricultural Journalism. He's currently editor of the Effective Farming magazine in Peter Marisburg, and Simon will speak on the topic, the nearest you can get to a free lunch. Simon Fisk. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I'm actually not sure what I'm going to be speaking about. Um, 
I was asked to prepare a talk today, which I did, um, and put it all down on paper. And I'd assumed that with all the illustrious spe speakers who were coming in front of me, that I could say more or less what I wanted to, because they would be talking on much more elevated subjects. But in fact, they've said most of what I want to say. Um, so this morning I scratched out a lot of things and started all over again. And now I've just heard uh, my friend Isaac Cronier speaking. And there's a great temptation to use my time to throw away my speech and reply to him. <laughs> um, I won't do that. I think that, that can come up in question time. But one thing which he did say I think is very important, um, which does need referring to, when he said that the farmers only get 40% of what the consumer pays. Obviously, it depends from product to product. And so it's really only 40%, he said, which is regulated, and the other 60% is in the free market. Now, with that statement, I disagree entirely. In fact, farming is not very heavily regulated in this country. You can plant whatever crop you want to, more or less where you want to. Anybody can get in and produce a bit of wheat. Anybody can produce some maize. Anybody can grow potatoes. Anybody can grow oranges. Anybody can grow apples. There is very little intervention there. Very few of the control boards, in fact, none of the control boards, with the possible exception of the dairy board, who I see have arrived late at the back, <laughs> um, with, with a possible exception of them, I don't think any of the control boards do interfere with the farmers. The three, in, three industries where the farmers are controlled by quota are the sugar farmers, the wine farmers, and the wattle growers, none of which have control boards. They've each got a separate act of parliament which, control, which controls them. In fact, what these control boards do is they control the people who account for that 60% adding on. They make sure that there's a total chewing gum between the farmer and the consumer. And that is their main job. And I think one of the questions which we really ought to address today is why we still have all these things. I think in the 1930s, before I was born, it was quite excusable for somebody to be a socialist or even a communist in those days. Socialism, communism were new ideas, very attractive. They were being pushed through. Uh, they were being lectured from uh, at, at schools, in universities. People hadn't seen why they were wrong. And I think a lot of innocent people, including the farmers, believed that socialism would work. I believe that by then, that's 50 years ago, 25 years ago, mid-1960s, I think it was already apparent to anybody intelligent that this experiment was failing. I was one of the ones who, I count myself as a little bit intelligent, so I noticed it before some other people. But I had a lot of sympathy with the people who hadn't seen what I'd seen and noticed what I had seen. I had an advantage in that I'd traveled a lot around the world. By the time I came here, I, I think this was about the 34th country I'd visited, and I was only 22 then. Uh, I spent a lot of time hitchhiking. <laughs> and I'd seen socialism at work, and I'd seen capitalism at work, and I'd seen the light. But during the past 25 years, there have been so many people saying what I've been saying, what Leon Lowe has been saying, what Mark Swanepoel has been saying, what all the speakers you've heard today have been saying, that there is absolutely no excuse whatsoever for anybody who still believes that socialism works. So you have to ask the question, why is it still there? The government says they want to get deregulate, but they don't do it. We want to privatize, it doesn't happen. Now ask this question, why have we still got all this mess and all these people doing unnecessary jobs whose sole contribution to life is to stop other people trading fairly? Why are they there? And I come to the conclusion that, in fact, those who keep these there fall into two categories. There are one are the fools who are absolutely so stupid that they can't see what's going on in front of them. And the other crowd 
are louts. They're rogues. They do know that it doesn't work, but they're going to lobby for it to stay there because they've got a vested interest in it somewhere in staying there. And I think that the number of fools that are left is getting smaller and smaller. The number of louts is staying about the same size, possibly growing. <laughs> One of the reasons I think there are so few of them who are fools, most of them louts, that even those who appear to be fooled by it, when they propagate these things, they always assume that everybody in the audience is a lout, even if they're not one. They always appeal to the base instincts of their audience. They don't say anymore, look, this grand plan will make the society work more efficiently. If they're talking to farmers, they say there's something in it for you as a farmer. If they're talking to consumers, they say, no, the farmers don't benefit, it's you consumers who benefit. If they're talking to middlemen, they say, no, no the farmers don't benefit, the consumers, it's you who benefits. They've accepted the fact, which all economists know, that intervention does have a social cost. You cannot get a politician to produce a free lunch. Whatever he does costs more than the benefits. So what we're left with is a few people who say, fine, it does cost more, but we're prepared to pay that penalty under certain circumstances. They say, a little bit of inefficiency is worth having as long as it produces a more just society, or as long as it ends up with a society which is more to my liking. That's what they usually mean when they say a just society. So they ask, what they're actually asking is saying, please, um, do a bit of robbing to pay for Peter to pay Paul. Um, I know that it's an inefficient process, but I will like the results of that better than the free market if you don't do it. So I think we need to examine that concept of robbing Peter to pay Paul first. I think it is so short-sighted and so stupid. And talking over lunch with people, I think the majority of the audience would agree with me. But there may be one or two of the people in the audience who are still in that category of fools, <laughs> uh, who haven't seen why robbing Peter to pay Paul is wrong. Let me explain. First of all, it's wrong because robbing is wrong. The commandment is thou shalt not steal. It's not thou shalt not steal except in a good cause. Ends do not justify means. They never can do. It's a der terribly dangerous thing to assume that you can act immorally because you've got a good intention. That was the road that Hitler took. It's the road that Stalin took. Secondly, robbing Peter to pay Paul is bad because it's very bad for Peter, the chap who gets robbed. Once he's been robbed by a government, he gets the message. The way to better himself is to not, not to go out and be useful to society and to produce something. It's actually to go to the government and say, well, since you're in the robbing business, will you please rob on my behalf? <laughs> so he's, once he's been taught that coercion is acceptable, he too starts using foul means for fine ends. The third reason it's wrong, it's bad, is that it's bad for Paul, the person on behalf on whose behalf the robbing goes on. Whatever else you may give him, you rob him of his dignity, of his self-respect and his spirit, his right to stand on his own two feet. And I think there's nothing more disgusting to rob a person of than the right to be an individual. So you make him poorer and less competent than he was before. And all over the plateau land, we have farmers like this, people whose fathers were too proud grandfathers were too proud to accept something taken from somebody else. And they're all sitting there with their knees knocking and saying, I can't carry on unless people carry on robbing on my other half. We've destroyed them as people. The fourth reason that robbing Peter to pay Paul is bad is it's, it's bad for you. If you put yourself in a position where you say, look, I know better than the Almighty how this world should have been organized, I'm going to rearrange it. I call this playing God. I think it's a terribly bad thing to do. It's a terribly arrogant thing to do. 
And I think we should remember that there's no sin that's worse than that. It was actually that for which Adam and Eve got cast out of the Garden of Eden. Because they sought, they ate of the tree of knowledge, they said, ate of the tree of knowledge of good and of evil, they said, they knew better laws for justice than the world had been equipped with. Let's go on and look at some of the um, antics of these people who are now robbing Peters and Pope Paul. One of the great myths is that this is a very charitable thing to do, that you're always taking away from the haves and giving to the have-nots. I know of no intervention which works that way around. It always ends up with the poor suffering more and the rich doing better. We saw the list of the top ten companies up there this morning. Every single one of those is getting a leg up from government. Poor little chaps. They can't compete with the informal sector. Tough, isn't it? The major beneficiaries are always haves. There's a very good reason for this, because the people who are clever and slick um, are just as good at accumulating votes and influence as they are at accumulating rands and cents and property. So they are the most skilled manipulators of the government. And the moment the government says, instead of stopping theft, we're in there to organise it, then they attract all the biggest and slimiest people around them to do that work for them. And it's always the little people that suffer. But the important thing to note is that nobody, even if you're a have, and you do benefit from this, you don't benefit for long. You can scramble on top of other people a little bit. You can take things, but the society that you, you create becomes less and less productive. So that although you end up a little bit higher up a, a, a pile, the pile keeps sinking. So that you, you don't, in fact, benefit yourself in the long run, even by doing that. No one is a beneficiary for long. When government is abused as an agent of theft, instead of an instrument to prevent it, no man's goods are safe. The accumulation of capital, on which all economic progress depends, is thwarted and discouraged. If nobody's savings are safe from plunder, then they don't accumulate them. If they can't invest them where it's sensible, what little is saved is invested badly. And so we end up with an economy growing slower and slower and slower, which is what we've got. And still there are people saying, can I please have a bigger slice of it? I think the message is quite clear, that the nearest you can possibly get to a free lunch is to make sure, firstly, and you've had this this morning, that there are no impediments to anybody who wants to cook you a cheaper one. And secondly, that no one, even in government, should be allowed to steal any of the ingredients, to take them by force. We've got this funny concept that um, if you take something out of somebody else's pocket, it's theft. If you go along to the government and say, will you please take it out of his pocket and put it into mine, it's not theft. <laughs> you must remember those things, those two things, but remember also that it isn't always cheapness that we're looking for in our lunches. We're also looking for variety. So you should be just as wary of anybody who tries to solicit your help in narrowing down the menu. I think the consumer movement is very vulnerable in this respect. Big business lobbies for this protection. And what they always do, they know that nowadays it's, it's not very polite to be selfish, so they always lobby on behalf of somebody else. And if they can find somebody who will squeal for something which suits them, they'll give them every single encouragement an awful lot of the things which are asked for in the name of consumerism are actually things which suit the people who are out to rip you off. And the same with the agricultural unions. 
I think it's, it's, I don't know how many agricultural congresses I've been to, but it always seems sad to me that you've got people at congresses who are voting time and time again for things which, in fact, make it more difficult for, for people to go between them and the consumer. And every time the person who lobbies for it, he's usually a director of a cooperative which has got a vested interest, but he says, look, unless you do this, you're going to, be on the, you're going to suffer. And in fact, all the farmers say, yes, do that then. Tighten up the middleman business. And all it means is there's less competition between the farmer and the consumer. Everybody in the lobby lobbying businesses knows that the golden rule of rent seeking, which is privilege hunting, is never to ask for the privilege for yourself. Subsidy and rent seekers invariably ask for the privileges they want on behalf of somebody else, and usually their victims. The agricultural markets and the food markets are rife with this. There's scarcely anything which gets onto your table or on the menu which hasn't been got at by the interventionists somewhere along the way. And there's a whole host of people now whose jobs depend on the perpetuation of those things. Things which were sometimes innocently asked for in the 1930s or 1940s, but now somebody who's been working there for 30 years, he's got his pension to worry about if they pack it up. But everybody's going for these things and trying to look after them. I'll end with just a few examples of the sort of thing I mean. The bread subsidy, we've had it today. Who are the beneficiaries? The big beneficiaries of the bread subsidy are premier oat, milling tiger oats, um, Sasco, it's the big bakeries. It's not the poor consumer. The poorest consumers don't even eat bread because they're in rural areas where they eat mealy meal. The big sufferers are the little bakeries which bake the sort of bread which doesn't get the subsidy. And the people who would like to be little bakeries but in fact can't get licenses. Compulsory damp, uh, date stamping of food. That's another one. Who's the suff sufferer there? Who, who does it suit? The big companies that are already date stamping, doing things in, in, in mass markets, they date stamp anyway. They love compulsory date stamping. It means all the little competitors have to do it as well. Minimum standards legislation. One goes over and over with these things. I think that question time may bring out some examples, but you should have got the message. Consumers must be wary. I think you do need protection. But but as consumers, we need it most from the abuse of government by mischievous people who regularly use it to steal taxes and subsidies from us and to restrict our race, range of choices. There's scarcely an item on our food thing, anything you produce, I could give you the case story of why it's got out. Nearly all of them have been got at by a bunch of affluent and work shy choice thieves and competition rigors and levy parasites on the way. And that's what they are. And if they haven't got the guts to admit that, I think they have to do a bit of soul searching. That's why it's because of those things, because of those choice thieves, competition rigors and levy parasites that your lunch is so expensive. It's also why an estimated 30,000 children die of malnutrition in this country each year. Finally, I think that it's the main reason why nowadays you live in fear behind locked doors, alarm systems, burglar guards, and nasty-tempered German dogs. There's a saying, I can't remember who it's from, I'm sure Leon Lowe would tell me, but the poor and uneducated will continue to cheat and steal as long as the rich and the educated teach them how. Thank you, Simon Fisk. It's time now for questions. I would ask you please to identify yourself and say where you're from. Uh, please direct your questions to a particular speaker. I don't want the speaker to be hogged 
to hog all the questions, so let's distribute them between all the other speakers as well. And Nancy is in the middle there if you want to ask a question. Yes, Suma. cheapest agricultural producers. They've got the same sort of climate, we're on the same latitude as you are here in South Africa. So far as I can see, you've got the same sort of geography. Our agricultural costs are so cheap that the American farmers say we're liars when we tell them at what cost we produce what we do produce. The National Farmers Federation in Australia would be shocked to hear some of the things that were said at this conference. They want to see marketing boards abolished, they want to see tariffs abolished, we have climate and we have weather in Australia, both. We have six-year droughts. Our national cattle herd and sheep herd go up and down like a yo-yo. We don't hear any whinging from our farmers. Could you please tell, explain why there should be this difference, Mr. Fisk? I haven't actually, I haven't actually been to Australia. Uh, I, <laughs> I try to follow what's going on. I, I, as I see it, in Australia and New Zealand, um, both of them have been through the marketing board phase um, and have come out of the other end, realising it was a big mistake. Um, they haven't dismantled it as far as we've done. Uh, or they haven't dis dismantled it as far... They've dismantled it further than we've done, but they haven't dismantled it completely. But I think that uh, it's part of a sort of worldwide process that everybody is realizing that this promise that the politicians could give us something for nothing just has, has proved empty. A very weak answer, I'm afraid. Next question. <clears throat> I think so. Are using that? Okay, yes. Yeah. I'm the president of the Black Consumer Union. And I'm directing my question to Mr. Isa Kronjie. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Kronjie is um, a farmer and producer and a chairman of your, your union, Farmers Union. I would like to know that when you sit in your boss, do you ever think of the minimum wage of your farm laborers? You spoke about a uh, fluctuation of your produce, maize, whatever. Um, when you sit, uh, presumably there are maize balls. When they sit in their balls, do they ever think of the black consumer who consumes most of their maize? And uh, I want to know whether you are suggesting that these boards I mean, I assume that these boards um, are created and they have created employment of personnel uh, and consumers are paying for them. Uh, Madam Chair, yes. Uh, the first question was whether we are at any stage uh, looking at the minimum wages of black farm laborers. Yes, we are. We are doing it. Uh, we had a lot of discussion over the past two, three years about uh, the minimum working conditions of farm laborers. We've looked at the, at the legislation in this regard. Uh, we have tried to find ways and means how this legislation could be also made uh, 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 applicable to, to, uh, to agriculture. Uh, and we are looking at this. We haven't uh, came to all the answers yet, but we are looking definitely at this. Uh, I think that labor at this stage, 
Labor is at this stage is a commodity that one's got to, 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 to um, uh, you know, you must, you must, uh, your labor won't stay with you if you don't pay them. If you don't pay them a wage that they are prepared to work for, they are, pre they are quite free to leave and they are leaving. Those who are not uh, wanting to stay, they are leaving and they are part of this migration system. But those uh, farmers who are treating their farm laborers well enough for them to stay there, they are staying there. They are, have, they are having uplif upliftment schemes for them. Uh, they are having um, uh, uh, educational schemes for them. I think you must come and visit us once in the district of Lienskron and you must see the, the huge scheme the Evans Group is, is running for their farm laborers there and all the others are following. These are, these are market leaders and the others are following. So yes, we are doing definitely. The other point that you raised was about, uh, uh, just to open up. Of products, uh, yes, and think of the black consumer. Oh, the black consumer, does, does the marketing board think about uh, the black consumer when they contemplate the price and so on? I think this is a point that should be put to the marketing boards from what I you know, read about. I'm not a member of any of the boards. Uh, fortunately, uh, <laughs> but from what I read uh, about the maize board, yes, they took into the consideration the possible reaction of, of uh, consumers by, uh, in the process of determining their price. Is there, there was another question? Is that all, Anonia? Um, Is there still another that I haven't answered yet? I think that's it. No, Thank, you. That's it. Um, Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Well done. Next question. Right. Mr. Carney, do you want to answer me? Yeah. Uh, folks, I'd like to just tell you that you're either being addressed by a fool or a lout. <laughs> And I think you'll have to work it out after I see what I have to say. And I'd also like to just add that there are quite a number of fellow fools and louts here with me. And you know the reason why we're here? We're here basically because we're very interested in the consumer. That's why we're here. No other reason. Because we realize that we and the consumers are actually partners in this business. We cannot, as earlier speakers have done, said, sell our commodities without the, commun the, the uh, uh, consumers wanting to buy them. Now, what I really want to do is just address a couple of the points made about the marketing boards and the whole question of marketing of commodities. The first point I want to make is that uh, I'm not going to, Simon and I have debated this on many occasions, but I'm not going to descend to the level of rhetoric that he did, because <laughs> I really don't think in an illustrious meeting of this nature that rhetoric of that emotional nature and personal nature is really in tune with the proceedings. That's really my personal view. But just coming back to the marketing boards, and we call them marketing boards and not control boards for a very good reason. That is because the emphasis has shifted from control to marketing. And yes, what Simon says about uh, a move away from total social systems to freer systems, we agree with that. We think that is the way things will go. In fact, if you look at the maize industry, for example, we used to control the re retail price of maize products. And we lifted that because we considered there was enough competition in the marketplace to make it unnecessary. We used to control wholesale prices. We lifted that too for the same reason. Uh, there used to be for a registration of maize millers. Not everybody could put up a maize mill. They had to uh, comply to certain conditions. That we've done away with. Any one of you can open a maize mill. So in other words, the point I want to make is that we are moving away from strictly controlled systems. But at this moment in time, we have a responsibility to you as consumers 
to keep supplying you with maize at reasonable prices. And as was mentioned earlier on, the situation with the world market is that it is totally an unrealistic market. If we exposed you as consumers to the price of that world market, you would get your maize very cheaply next year. But the following year, you wouldn't get maize because the farmers just couldn't keep in production that long. And then you would have to import at 400, 500 rand a ton. With potatoes, we've seen the situation where prices have dropped from eight, nine rand a, a pocket last year to two, three rand this year. That is acceptable with potatoes in this respect, that you can eat other things. It's not a staple, but with maize. Can you imagine if maize prices rose from, say, 200 rand a ton to 1,000 rand a ton over a period of two years? What hardship that could cause? Can I just interrupt? Sure. I, I don't mind making a, a, a clarifying statement as you are. I'm enjoying this. But can I just rule that uh, if you want to do that, please give me two minutes to make your comment. I like your comment. But then we give everybody else a chance and come back again later. I, I'll stop my two minutes now. No, you've had almost three. <laughs> okay, so, okay, I, okay, fine. I'll, I'll close if I, I understand okay. your problem, yeah. then, Madam okay. Chair. Yeah. And just say, please, folks, realize that we're here as marketing boards because we're interested in you as consumers. We are working for the best system to make sure we can give you a good deal in terms of the prices of agricultural commodities. And my question to Simon is, I just want to check, am I... A laugh or a fool? I'm not quite sure on that one. You want to answer that, Simon? Yeah, I'd, I'd, love, I'd love to. I've been trying to work it out for years, Peter. <laughs> right. Um, could, could I just read him what, just in case he ever gets hold of my written paper, could I read him one sentence from it? So when an altruistic apologist for the maze board speaks to consumers, he seldom attempts to justify it by saying that he's there to make the maze farmers wealthier. He says he's acting in the interests of consumers. Give us a speaker at the back. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. I'm Madam Winnie from Transkei. Go ahead. Madam Chair, I, I'm a bit concerned. You know, I've attended so many seminars, good meaning seminars, and I've listened really to good speeches. But what worries one is that uh, we, we, we talk so well, but uh, when we go out, very little is done. I'm wondering and, and if what we're, going, we're saying today is going to take fruit, and if it does, this is what I, I would like to be answered on. What do we do in order that this land act is scrapped? Because the, the, I, I think we rural blacks, as I am, we don't only wish to be consumers, we want to be producers and we can. The only thing we, we, we were, the tools that we used to use were taken away. For instance, I, when I grew up, we had a, a, a whole field where we planted wheat, mills, and all that. But there was a time of the so sad resettlement when our land was, the one man's land was divided into four people. Really, this has really made the black men very poor at the rural areas. And we do not like to be called poor. We want to be people like anybody. Now, I would love to say that today, I want to know how this Land Act can be scrapped, and we work on that. Thank you. Would any of the speakers like to reply to that? <coughs> Isak? No. Um, I think uh, we will take the, the, uh, your statement and just note it, and perhaps think about it again. The next questioner? Yes.
So, referring to the Australian speaker, I'm sorry about my voice, can we not start now by passing a resolution from this meeting asking for the government to give earnest and urgent, sorry about my voice, attention to free marketing. That was Mrs. Rose Cantor from the Consumer Union. Um, Rose, thank you for your comments and uh, for, for your suggestion. I think uh, the, uh, the organizers of the committee have not really considered that resolutions will be taken, but we will be taking note of it and think about it again, because I think it's, it's an important point to take, but we're not going to debate that at this moment. Um, I have indicated to this gentleman here that he can speak. I'm Mike Davies from the Bukutuswara Marketing Board and uh, the good news is we're moving away from control and regulation to as much privatization and free enterprise as possible. Uh, Simon, a colleague of mine, I'd just like to address this to him, is, and it pertains to the maize industry and I'd like your comment Simon, is with the ruling prices which are here at this stage and the oversupply and overproduction which is occurring resulting in export losses. Wouldn't it be common sense to drop the price of maize further, therefore sending the signal to the farmer not to produce as much, and by dropping the price of maize to stimulate demand not only in the maize industry and giving it to the rural poor, if I can say that, but also stimulate the meat industry by giving uh, cheaper feed through to the uh, meat industry and thereby stimulating the meat industry as well. I'm glad you read effective farming. <laughs> Right, next question on that side, Nancy. Audrey Tingley from Florida. Please, Mr. Fisk, I'd like to ask you, how does one actually qualify for a subsidy? Thank you. Right. Um, there are no rules. That's the nasty thing about it. Basically, it's a totally lawless system where by the government, which I think does have a very important role to uphold law, to keep law and order. I'm a strong believer in law and order, but I believe that the government should have rules that are debated itself. In fact, what happens with subsidies is all you've got to do is to frighten enough politicians and um, get them to behave nastily on your behalf. <laughs> Isaac, would you like to comment on that? Oh, I don't. No, no. Right. They're particularly vulnerable at the moment, incidentally. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My interest is particularly on land. I am glad that uh, our representative from the Transkai has already mentioned it. Starvation is in this country is a deliberate, a deliberate means of keeping the blacks down. We are not starving because we cannot produce enough food for ourselves. We are starving because Peter has robbed us of our land and given it to Paul. Perhaps we should find a, a, a method of reversing that. Uh, Mr. Kronjia, you mentioned that the maize that was imported from America, when uh, milled, became a fluffy thing that could not be used. I, I disagree with you because in Northwest America, where I was, I was told that maize is particularly grown in, this area, in that area to feed animals not human beings. So you must have ordered that maize deliberately because you knew that you don't eat it, I eat it. That's why you ordered it. Uh, the, the, the third question I would like to ask is, in these maize boards and maize unions, is there no possibility of blacks being 
represented in those boards and unions, whatever they are called, because you are deciding things that affect us without us. Thank you, Sally. Isaac, would you like to reply to that? I think the first part is, is quite easy. <laughs> no, the, the first part about the quality of the maize, it was a fact, it was yellow maize. And the lady is quite right, yellow maize is not used for human consumption in our country. But during those years that I was talking about, 1983 to 1985, there was a, a, a huge shortage of white maize. And they imported yellow maize and mixed it with, with, uh, with the white meal. You can still remember that, uh, that uh, yellowish color of, of maize meal that we got in those days. But they mixed it to, to, have it more, uh, to make it more palatable. So uh, the problem is that if we don't have white maize in this country produced, where are we going to find it? Uh, because the, uh, the United States of America doesn't produce white maize as far as I'm concerned. So they may be, they may be land, uh, countries like uh, Argentine or I don't know where you will find it, but very limited. The other quest, part of the question was that uh, uh, the lady addressed me about uh, what, uh, a, a consumer representative. Yes, a consumer representative on these councils. I think that if the black consumer uh, councils uh, want represented want to be re represented uh, on any of these boards, they must ask for it, that's all. Um, can I just reply to that as well? Uh, there are eight marketing boards, which are mostly food boards that have consumer representatives on it. Um, these uh, new consumer representatives are identified by a consumer body, and we have in the past uh, I have nominated people of other color, and I think I foresee the day that people will get onto those boards. It has to work through a system, and your organization and mine can work towards it. So I think the time will come that it will be no normal process. A next questioner, please. Mr. Liebenberg. Madam Chair. Andres Liebenberg from the uh, Wheat Board. I feel very complimented that nobody got up and uh, walked out while I was preparing to address you. <laughs> so thank you very much for that. Madam Chair, listening to uh, Simon Fisk, one would get the impression that uh, South Africa is the only country where you have establishments in agriculture. Um, we should also take note of what uh, Ms. Shenoy, is that the correct pronunciation, uh, said about Australia. We uh, receive many delegations of farmers from Australia and they are all complaining like our own farmers about the financial position the Australian farmer also finds himself in. Now, Madam, if we are uh, asking for the dismantle, dismantling the uh, establishment in South Africa, it did happen in New Zealand. The a previous speaker was quite right about that. But after that, the wheat farmer completely disappeared from the New Zealand scene. The uh, position in Australia is also that as far as the servicing of the domestic market is concerned, they have made uh, amendments to their system. But nevertheless, the Australian Wheat Board remains a major operator <coughs> on the Australian wheat scene, being a statutory body. Now coming back to South Africa, my question is, why are we asking for the dismantling of the establishment in South Africa while the EEC as a group of governments and the USA maintain their establishments. And how is the South African 
primary producer going to compete against those governments still maintaining their establishments? I maintain, uh, Madam, that that is not possible. So therefore, we should take note of what Mr. Cronier has told us about what is happening in the uh, GATT negotiations, and only if the major competitors on the, uh, uh, in the international wheat trade has indicated that they are also prepared to move in the direction of liberalizing their own practices in their own countries, then it can be expected from South Africa to do the same. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, seven, I, I appreciate that other countries have got intervention. I think the important thing is that we've now recognized, uh, and I think Mr. Liebenberg would agree with me on this, that in fact free markets are more efficient. The trend is towards deregulation. But at the moment, South Africa has a lot of regulations, even those countries he mentioned don't have. Um, the EEC has a ghastly complicated system, but at least it doesn't stipulate how large baker's ovens should be. So there's a lot of internal deregulation we should do. The wheat in Europe is not channeled through one series of marketing silos. There's competing grade traders. So we can do a tremendous amount of, of, of deregulation inside. I accept, I fully accept, that there may be a case for an interim period of us having something to protect us against other countries which have got horribly disruptive governments. Just in the same way as we need uh, an army to protect ourselves against an invading army. I think that we possibly do need something to stop um, Poland dumping all its eggs on us, for instance. I know the egg board is here as well. Uh, which might knock our, our egg business out of, uh, out of the line. But I don't accept for the fact that because we've got an army, we have to use it against our own citizens internally. And I think this is what the control boards are doing. The control boards are fiddling around with South Africans trading with other South Africans. And I don't think there's any excuse for that. I think the message is there that deregulation must come. The government has got it. I believe that probably 21 of the 22 control boards have now got that message. And I'm very glad of that, that this deregulation is coming. But I, I, I can't for the life of me understand as to why you say, OK, we were wrong in the past, we've got to be good in future, but let's become good slowly. Now, I think, <laughs> having seen that you're wrong, you should take the decisions as quickly as you possibly can do. Um, there was a question from the break from, um, I think it's Mrs. Matawani from Transkai. Uh, Joe Matuna wanted to uh, comment on it. Joe? Thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair. And actually, I've got uh, a note from Leon Lo here regarding the, the statistics that uh, Dr. Msuyani gave us in his uh, speech. He said 13% uh, of the land is, been, uh, is in the hands of the blacks, when in actual fact, uh, Leon Lo says effectively it could be 1%. Actually, I feel like going to the men's room. <laughs> uh, if I may reply to the question of uh, the lady from the Transcar regarding the scraping of the Land Act, uh, I would say that uh, the people with the brighter faces here in this conference are going to the polls on the 6th of next month. Those are the people who are going to indicate to us as to whether they want us to progress or they want uh, to render South Africa. Uh, so I think they may not have the guts to say that, but I think they owe us, they owe, they owe it to this land to suit it to be that we are making a, a bigger stride towards a change, and I mean change in the very true sense of the word, and that the, uh, the inhibitive uh, acts that are still prevailing, you know, them, the Separate Amenities Act, the Land Act, um, these, the Population Restoration Act, Group Areas Act, you know, I can say them all by heart actually. Those uh, acts 
have got to be done away with. So I'm saying that uh, the people who, who have the fortunate, uh, who are fortunate to, to vote, must tell us on the sixth whether they want uh, to see progress in this country. Thank you. Next question. This question was almost answered, but I'd like it to be exactly answered. It is this question of Land Act. As the figures have been given, 1387. And when you look at the endless removals of black people from private and communal land, I'm just wondering if somebody has, is doing some homework to keep the, the country up to date with the fraction of the land that really belongs to the black people. Because when somebody said 1%, I could almost say hurrah, and I wanted to sit down. But because this X, one, it keeps on saying, but people are endlessly removed from their own private lands, and people keep on looking at them and thinking that black people ought to be showing more initiative in providing I'm thinking particularly on Dr. Mutsoyani's paper. And if anybody can give us the almost correct proportion of who owns what fraction of the land in this country, following on these endless removals in this country. Ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who do not know her, that's Dr. Ellen Koswayo. She's the founding president of the Black Consumer Union, and she and perhaps Margaret Lessing are the doyens of the consumer movement in South Africa. And of course, do not let us forget the Housewives League, but you haven't got your founders here, have you? So, yes. Yeah. Where's Mrs. Preller? <laughs> salute you and both Mrs. Lessing and Elokos Wine. It's jolly good to have you here. Can we have the next question, please? Oh, sorry, um, Dr. Koswayo. Um, do you want anybody to comment on your yes, question? Leon, yes. Leon, would you like to comment on that? Okay. Yes, it's normally said that... Uh, where is Mrs. Koswayo? Vanished there. It's normally said that blacks have 13% of the land in South Africa, but that's an over-optimistic statement. The land in black areas is not owned by blacks. This is a great error. Uh, virtually all of it is in the hands of the biggest landowner in South Africa, the Development Trust, the old Bantu Trust. And that which is not in the, is, is registered in the name of the homeland governments most of the land registered in the name of the homelands government is administered by tribal authorities but not owned by them. The land owner is in fact the government. But the homeland governments are in fact a small minority landowner in most of the homeland areas. Outside the homelands in the black townships, until this year in fact, thanks largely to Professor Tago, who I think has gone home because she's sick, blacks will own land for the very first time. Until this year, in effect, blacks have not been allowed to own land anywhere in South Africa, not even in the black areas. And for the first time, real black land ownership is now happening strangely enough in the white areas, not in, in either the homelands. I mean in the townships. Uh, my own estimate is that it's below 1% of the land is owned by black people. And that is in the old... Uh, uh, the, the, the leftovers, if you like, things like black spots, and a few of the, a few of the, of the, of the homelands or the self-government states. 
uh, we have, as it happens, one of the ministers here from one of the self-governing states that is indeed introducing uh, genuine ownership, and that's Kongwani, and the others are as well. But uh, uh, until now, there's been virtually zero black land ownership in South Africa. 13% is, in fact, an overstatement. Um, right. uh, could I, while I have the uh, microphone, just one minute, one, one point to uh, the uh, to Itzhak, and that is, what fascinates me is that farmers don't see the control boards in their control function, as opposed to marketing, which uh, we've heard they're moving towards, as a problem for farmers. So you mentioned, you made a lot of about price stabilization. Now, price stabilization is terribly harmful for farmers. You actually want the price to be unstable. And all the wisdom of economics tells you that the price can only perform its function of stabilizing markets and income for farmers if the price moves up and down quickly. In other words, when there's a crop shortage or failure, you actually want the price to rise so that you get the same income and when there's a surplus, you want it to fall. Price stabilization is not a good objective. It's actually a bad thing for farmers. And I'm often surprised when I hear farmers wanting stable prices. You should actually want maximally flexible prices, which brings about the best stable incomes for farmers and indeed the best position for consumers, which is no shortages or surpluses. All right. Is that you want to reply to that? Uh, Madam Chair, yes, Mr. Lowe mentioned the price stability. I think that uh, I mentioned price stability because of the fact that the Maze Board is of the idea that uh, price stability is something that the consumer wants. Uh, and uh, not what, what the farmer wants is income stability. That is what the farmer wants. So, what I mentioned price stability because of the fact that uh, the maize board is of the idea that they're handling a uh, strategic product and that the consumer is looking for, uh, for price stability. But if the consumer doesn't want price stability, they must say so. Um, we have to finalize for team. Mr. Carney, one last word from you. I'd just like to answer the question. Basically, the situation is this, that we are saying to our farmers that when we have a large exportable surplus, that their price will be lower than when we have a smaller crop. So in other words, we, we are, do not, at this moment in time, subscribe to the policy of price stability for the farmers. Uh, the price must obviously alter according to the dictates of the market. What we do endeavor to do, however, is keep the domestic, the consumer price uh, relatively protected from world market influences so that it doesn't fluctuate unnecessarily. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just conclude this session by thanking again Isa Kronier, Joe Matuna and Simon Fisk for addressing us this afternoon. I think not all our questions have been answered, it's set us thinking, but can I then uh, ask you to go to tea and Terry, what time do you want us back? In 20 minutes' time, we will be back here. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Gentlemen, are we all here? Right, before we start this session, I have been asked to give Miss Shanoi 
a few minutes to speak. Um, well, the reason why I asked for a minute or two is because I just wanted to put in a factual point, and that is that the National Farmers Federation in Australia definitely want all the marketing boards to be abolished. They're against the wheat board and they do want it to go. Ian McLaughlin, who's the head of the National Farmers Federation, is a free trader. In fact, the National Farmers Federation want free trade for the country, not just abolition of sub any sort of subsidies for agriculture, but also they want free trade for the whole economy. Uh, another point which I thought I might mention, the New South Wales Egg Board has recently been abolished. We now have a free market in eggs. The reason why we have a free market in eggs is because there were so many illegal hens laying illegal eggs that just couldn't keep it up. Oh dear, what's that there? Um, ladies and gentlemen, I've been asked to mention to you that um, we haven't actually anticipated as an organizing committee to, t to um, pick resolutions out of today and tomorrow's um, uh, conference. But it's quite obvious, listening to people speaking, that this is in fact the wish of the people who are here today. So may we ask you please, if you could write your resolution on a piece of paper, pass it up to any of the organizing committee or to Nancy, who everybody knows who's controlling the mics, and then we can have a look at these and we can bring them up um, perhaps at the end of proceedings tomorrow, if that is satisfactory for you. Right, we now come to session four, which is the last session today. We've had a very, very full day so far. I hope you're all wide awake and nobody is uh, suffering from uh, sitting too long. Um, economic times, in today's economic times, of course, finances and money are, all, are extra, extra uh, important to all of us as consumers. And in this session, we are going to look at financial services. Our first speaker will be Dr. Brian Benfield. He's Managing Director of AA Life and President of the Insurance Institute of South Africa. He's one of the two individuals in South Africa who holds a doctoral degree in life insurance. He will speak on the topic insurance, taxation, intervention, and reaction. Dr. Benfield. Mevrouw uh, Morris, dames en heren, mijn uh, toespraak is zo'n snaakse toespraak van mij, vooral voor de geest, uh, die wat die van mij vertegenwoordigd uh, is. Dat herinnert mij aan al die snaakse stories wat op die oomlik van uh, Zuidwest Namibia uitkom. Ik hoor als een uh, daar wat uh, elke tweede dag voor een van die untap mensen daar vraagt, hij zei. Uh, was jij al op uh, Ochi Waranga? En uh, zei die een ou oh, nee. Hij zei dan, uh, word jij zeker voor mijn zuster Santi te kennen, want zij was ook nooit op Ochi Waranga. Nie. <laughs> and that sort of reminds me of the, of the sort of logic that applies to much of our legislation, ladies and gentlemen. And I hope that I won't confuse you this afternoon with a topic such as, 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 as I have. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in South Africa over the past several years, and uh, particularly in more recent times, we've been experiencing a period of amazing and almost unparalleled continuity and change. Politically, I believe all of us are living in a significant turning point in the history of our country. It is difficult for most of us to imagine, black and white, but in the very near future, I believe we should all be living in a truly different South Africa. We are the final generation of an older community and the first of a new. Uh, much of our personal confusion, anguish and disorientation can be traced directly to the conflict within ourselves, within our political institutions, and uh, between the era which is presently dying and the emergent new one which is thundering in to take its place. And while this transition will be difficult, I believe it's, uh, the South African nation is ready for it. I believe we are ready to restructure our society from one dominated by short-term considerations and rewards to one favoring things in much longer time frames. This maturing process will eventually leave us far better off 
of the far happier and more fulfilled populace. Now incorporated in this new dispensation, ladies and gentlemen, will be undoubtedly the present worldwide trend towards greater recognition of personal liberties and individual freedoms, a return to the market economy and a turn away from the now thoroughly discredited socialist practices. Turning to my own field, life assurance, and speaking of change and the need for us to take a broader and uh, longer term view, my appeal today is for us to take a long, broad and sensible view of the objectives, constraints and results of the sixth schedule to the Income Tax Act. Now don't leave me now, you, you don't, don't fall asleep at this point. I'm going to try to make it as interesting as possible. I won't address the Act directly so you shouldn't be too greatly bored. Some of those present, or very few I imagine, uh, would have heard of the sixth schedule to the Income Tax Act, but I trust that after today you will recognize it as having been one of the most expensive and determined long-term efforts at state intervention in the South African economy ever undertaken. It has been one of the most unsuccessful and counterproductive as well. Ladies and gentlemen, when the sixth schedule was added to the Income Tax Act in 1972, South Africa proudly joined the ranks of the taxation superpowers where taxation is considered not to have the right tone unless it is stupefyingly overwhelming, impossibly intricate and preferably incomprehensible. The object of the sixth schedule was clearly indicated by the Minister of Finance, Dr. Nico Diedrichs, in 1972 in his budget speech to Parliament, and I have a quote from Hansard here to tell you why he introduced it. Thank you, Terry. He said, it has come to my notice that during 1969 insurance companies commenced marketing certain single premium insurance policies on such terms that they are in effect no more than ordinary fixed deposits. The general provisions contained in the Income Tax Act in respect of traditional insurance policies are being exploited tut tut, by means of these so-called insurance policies in order to grant tax-free benefits to a small group of wealthy taxpayers. Lately the movement has gained momentum and not only is large-scale tax avoidance taking place, but funds estimated to be in excess of 50 million rand, we subsequently discovered it was 20 million rand, have been drained from other financial sectors, especially the building societies. Legislation will be introduced, he said, to plug the loophole in the Insurance Act as from the current tax year. This should bring in some extra tax and should also restore balance in the financial sector. Those who wish to avoid paying tax should rather make use of tax-free <laughs> government investments. <laughs> this is a quote from Hansard. <laughs> should have the letters SIC after that, I guess. Now, what this intricate piece of legislation concerned itself with, ladies and gentlemen, was the determination of the gain derived from certain life insurance policies that must be included in gr uh, a gross income in terms of paragraph EA of the definition of uh, gross income in section 1 of the Income Tax Act. And in effect, it provided that under certain life assurance policies, any amounts derived by the insured uh, will be taxable subject to certain deductions. This means that even though in certain circumstances, such amounts represent fortuitous accretions to the wealth of the insured or the policy owner and are thus of a capital nature, they are nevertheless taxed in terms of the sixth schedule. Now, it was claimed that the sixth schedule was introduced to prevent tax avoidance mainly arising from single premium investment policies used as tax-free investments. In fact, the legislation con uh, concerned has since 1972 had the effect of annihilating the personal single premium investment policy. It has been so successful in its destruction of the formerly legitimate savings medium that it remains an ongoing testament to the fact that tax legislation can both create and destroy, no matter how complex its wording. And for those who are not familiar with it, the sixth schedule comprises four parts, uh, each containing definitions and provisions, and uh, each with cross-references to the other. The sixth schedule introduced such terms as standard policy, non-standard policy, deemed standard policy, conforming policy, non-conforming policy, and I can go on all afternoon. And while a standard policy could be a tax-free policy, <coughs> but may not be, a non-standard policy is always a taxable policy. And while a personally owned standard policy is always tax-free, a company-owned standard policy may be either tax-free or taxable. 
And although a standard policy may be deemed to become a non-standard policy, a non-standard policy cannot become a standard policy. <laughs> it's in the Act. <laughs> then again, a non-conforming policy may be deemed a standard policy at the time the proceeds become available. The far-sighted ingenuity, thank you, sir. The far-sighted ingenuity of the draftsmen of this Act uh, was such that it required just a little alteration, a little amendment over the years. And with the sole purpose, mark you, of preventing taxpayers from making one single premium payment to an insurer instead of a series of smaller payments over a period of time, this piece of legislation has had an interesting legislative history. After having been introduced in 1972, it was first amended by Act 65 of 1973. It was again amended in 1974 and again in 1975. It required further amendment in 1978 and again in 81 and again in 83. In 1984 it was amended by Act Number 121. In 1985 it was amended again by Act Number 96. In 1986 the notorious, now notorious, after dinner amendment was made, this time with a retrospective aspect to it, when the Minister of Finance was invited to speak to a gathering of uh, insurance executives one evening. And I presume he hasn't been uh, invited since for fear that he might be inclined to present an encore. <laughs> in 1987, the sixth schedule was amended again by, 19, uh, by Act Number 85. And each of these amendment, amendments, ladies and gentlemen, of course, had the, uh, the, the effect of making the Act more and more complex. Because of the immense complexity of this piece of legislation, possibly the most, piece, uh, most complex piece of legislation in the history of our country, the drafting of amendments to this piece requires the highest level of competence and there is much consultation required between many very learned men prior to each amendment being promulgated. It is therefore hard to ex uh, assess what the direct cost has been of drafting and amending the sixth schedule over the past 17 years. Its indirect cost to the life assurance industry and to the nation's savings as a whole are of course incalculable. Today, mention of the sixth schedule sends almost visible cold shivers down the back of, backs of most inland revenue officials, as they've come to know that it is horrendously complex and that they have the greatest difficulty in training their staff at the various revenue offices around the country in the application of this portion of the Act. Indeed, no one is believe, when no one is believed to be listening, certain senior revenue officials have been overheard to admit that the damn thing is completely incomprehensible and almost impossible to administer. And apart from putting this impossible burden upon the administering authorities, the life industry itself has had heavy new burdens placed upon it by the sixth schedule. Goodness, I have a question already. Um, it has been forced to try to comprehend the incomprehensible. The more recent amendments have required the industry to police the application of the sixth schedule and to advise the authorities when a standard policy becomes non-standard. To notify a policyholder and the local receiver of revenue every time it issues what it considers to be a non-standard policy. To deduct or withhold tax whenever it considers it has paid a taxable benefit. And to pay this amount to the Secretary for Inland Revenue within 14 days thereof. Then it has to issue a certificate showing the amount withheld or deducted and also notify the Secretary for Inland Revenue of the payment of any insurance benefits uh, uh, which no tax, from which no taxable gain arises, except in the case of non-taxable benefits unless the benefit become payable under the policy ceasing in terms of paragraph 14.1e by reason of a surrender in whole when the insurer indeed need not issue a certificate unless required to do so by the Secretary. <laughs> In addition, the sixth schedule provides that the insurer is absolutely liable for the due payment to the secretary of any amount that he has required to deduct. Should he omit to do so, for whatever reason, the secretary for inland revenue may recover such an amount, together with interest, from the insurer, whether he deducted it from the policyholder's payment or not. Now, what have the results been of this piece of legislation, ladies and gentlemen? They've been interesting, to say the least. Many of the amendments... Uh, which have been made to the Act have arisen as a result of the creativity and ingenuity of the industry and insurance intermediaries across the country. Quite naturally, those areas not prescribed or circumscribed by the Act have become legitimate areas for the development of new policies and practices. This has meant that the sixth schedule led to the development of a product which was known by the, uh, known, uh, by the term 5x5, five five, and after this policy was effectively outlawed by one of the amendments, uh, we developed a 9x10 and the 10x10, 
in addition, we have developed the back-to-back -back annuity schemes, uh, and there is now a policy available to companies known as the non-conforming deemed standard corporate investment policy. <laughs> Perfectly serious. In addition, the sixth schedule has uh, given birth to uh, and seen the subsequent demise of various other schemes, many of which have been legitimate in terms of the then legislation. These include such things as payroll-based deferred compensation and key man assurance plans, all devised uh, with the general view of achieving maximum after-tax investment yields, a fairly wholesome and laudable objective for any investor one would have thought. But perhaps the most important, ladies and gentlemen, the most important result of this piece of legislation uh, has been the uh, nurturing of the growth of a whole new industry in South Africa, that of tax consultancy. An industry which makes use of some of the most educated and creative minds in our country, applying themselves diligently to the sterile matter of tax avoidance, rather than the development of new products and the creation of new wealth for our nation as a whole. Now one might ask whether this most complex piece of legislation has been successful in its objective over the past 17 years or not. After all this time, effort, money, application of very learned people, has this act, this piece of the Income Tax Act been successful? Apart from the unforeseen developments to which uh, it has given birth, as I've just mentioned, has it prevented or at least severely curtailed single premium investment policies? Has it satisfied the banks and building societies who went dashing off to the minister in the early 1970s claiming that not only were these policies causing large-scale tax avoidance but they were draining funds from the other financial sectors and thereby unnaturally distorting the flow of funds to banks and building societies. Has all this energy, brilliance and complexity succeeded over the past 17 years in achieving Dr. Diedrich's stated objective of restoring balance in the financial sector? Indeed, has it achieved what Dr. Diedrich said when he introduced this legislation in 1972 and encouraged those who wish to avoid paying tax to make use of tax-free investments offered by the government. Ladies and gentlemen, I've prepared a slide showing just how successful this piece of legislation has been in the curtailment of single premium investment. Uh, these statistics have been obtained from the Life Officers Association and show the figures at the time of the introduction of legislation in 1972 and how they have been curtailed since then. You will notice that uh, there's been more than a 150-fold increase in single premium business over the period and that the rate of growth of this business has in fact accelerated since 1972 uh, rather than declining. I have not researched how much money found itself being invested in tax-free government investments, but I intuitively feel that you would not be impressed if I had those statistics available today. Total life offer single premium has uh, risen from 29 million in 1972 to over 4.4 billion in 1987. Today the Life Office Association have just released their 1988 figures which show the figures uh, still to exceed 4.1 billion. Clearly the sixth schedule has failed, ladies and gentlemen, in its objective despite the time and effort put into it by so very many clever minds. And apart from its obvious failure and the fact that it has had so many unforeseen and unintended consequences, have the banks and building societies been satisfied? Well, ladies and gentlemen, clearly they have not been. The flow of funds has continued towards the life offices, notwithstanding the most determined efforts by the authorities and the building societies to stop it. The reasons for this continued flow center, of course, on the fact that investors prefer to obtain a positive after-tax yield on their investments than to put their money in savings accounts and fixed deposits. They center on the fact that inflation is out of control and, will, and, the, and the investors will continue to seek real returns no matter how clever the legislators become. In fact, the wails of the building society movement became so loud that the unfortunate Ministry of Finance felt that it simply had to do something. Eventually, the insurance industry, taking pity on the poor minister and of its own volition, agreed in 1988 to curtail its own business voluntarily, self-censorship if you like, uh, so that we have curtailed voluntarily our own business for terms of less than five years. Always willing to be of assistance, the life officers voluntarily agreed among themselves to no longer accept any kind of investment which produced any kind of positive return over any term of less than five years. And yet this has still failed to satisfy the building societies who persist with their view that life officers succeed because they're under-taxed. 
And this, notwithstanding the fact that their representations in this regard over the past several years have now been thoroughly discredited. A proper basis for the taxation of life officers has recently been introduced after a thorough investigation lasting several years showed that life officers were in fact paying too much tax and not too little. Our information is that the Building Society's representatives are unrepentant and still unwilling to address the root cause of their dilemma, which of course is inflation, always and everywhere a government-induced phenomenon, and their inability to provide real returns to the investors' funds, partly as a result of government controls on their own investment activities. Hence, ladies and gentlemen, we have an object lesson in the result of government intervention in the forces of the market. A more determined, more comprehensive, and a more thorough attempt at intervention has seldom been made in any other South African legislation than in the sixth schedule to the Income Tax Act. And everything has been achieved except the object of the Act. The costs to the nation, both directly and indirectly, have been incalculable. These have included the misallocation of scarce resources, the growth of an unproductive tax avoidance advice industry, the continuing dissatisfaction of banks and building societies, and of course the disgruntlement of the insurance industries and its clients alike. In some instances the sixth schedule has made criminals of companies and individuals who were simply going about the legitimate business of maximizing after-tax investment yields and in some instances it has led to severe losses being suffered by investors who misunderstood the legislation or who were victims of poor advice on or a retrospective amendments to that legislation. I can do no better here, ladies and gentlemen, than to quote the great father of economics, Adam Smith, uh, who 300 years ago wrote these words. Every system, he said, which endeavors, either by extraordinary encouragements, to draw towards a particular species of industry a greater share of the capital of the society than what would naturally go to it, or by extraordinary restraints, force from a particular species of industry some share of the capital which otherwise would be employed in it, is in reality subversive of the great purposes, purpose which it means to promote. It retards, instead of accelerating, the progress of the society towards real wealth and greatness, and diminishes instead of increases the real value of the annual produce of its land and labor. And this could not have been more appropriate, ladies and gentlemen, to the sixth schedule. And whilst I'm in full sympathy with the Ministry of Finance in its difficulty regarding the distribution of savings and investment in South Africa, and whilst I do not envy it its visitation of weeping, wailing and gnashing of teeth by banks and building societies uh, over the past decades, I, I feel certain that it is now high time for us to entirely scrap the sixth schedule to the Act. The proper place for the definition of insurance is of course in the Insurance Act and not in the Income Tax Act. Should it be thought absolutely necessary, necessary, the Minister may apply himself to this Act if there are indeed any continuing abuses arising from single premium business. For my own part, I am persuaded there are few occasions when the desire of an investor to achieve maximum after-tax returns could be considered an abuse of any sort. Life officers are today paying tax on behalf of both policyholders and shareholders on a formula based on sound principles. The Minister of Finance acknowledges that they are still in fact paying more tax than is theoretically correct. And the new tax formula will ultimately ensure the appropriate taxation of life assurance policies irrespective of their premium paying term. It is my contention therefore, ladies and gentlemen, that it is now well past the time for scrapping this sixth schedule, a singularly unsuccessful and enormously expensive misguided attempt at legislative intervention in the investment practices of the private sector. The interventionist interlude must come to an end because, as it has been handsomely illustrated by this example, all varieties of interference with the market phenomena will not only fail to achieve the ends aimed at by the authors, but invariably bring about a, a state of affairs far less desirable than the previous state which they were designed to alter. Thank you and God bless. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Benfield. Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is Mr. Ian Hetherington. He was born in London and has worked as an accountant in the US, the UK, and Nigeria. After obtaining an MBA degree from Harvard, he came to South Africa to serve as chairman of the Norton Group in 1969.
He left that position in 1980 to become chairman of the Small Business Advisory Services. He is also managing director of the Job Creation SAPTY Limited, a member of the Industrial Committee of NAFCOC, and a director of the LeBeur Development Corporation. He was the 1986 recipient of the Free Market Award, and this, morning, this afternoon he will speak on the topic, What Stops the Poor from Borrowing? Mr. Heatherington. Thank you, Madam Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I've been asked to comment on what it is that stops the poor from borrowing. The only thing that stops the poor from borrowing is that the established financial institutions won't lend to them. In other words, the problem is on the supply side, not on the demand side. Plenty of poor people would like to borrow. There's no lack of demand. But no large financial institution believes that it could make profits by meeting their borrowing needs. There's therefore almost no supply, or no supply that is from conventional <coughs> legal sources. The problem's not peculiar to South Africa, and nor is it very new. I was reading a book uh, recently called At the Works, written in 1907 by a lady called Florence Bell. Lady Florence Bell. Lady Bell was the wife of Hugh Bell, who was one of the leading iron founders and employers in Middlesbrough, Yorkshire in England. She was one of those great Victorians. Wealthy and well-born herself, she spent much of her life involving herself in improving the social conditions for the poorer working communities. For over 30 years, she investigated how the poor families in her town lived, but not just as an academic. She was also the founder of a working men's club, and she established inexpensive recreation facilities. She wrote in this book of how the poor lived in England a hundred years ago. Interesting things. They frequently used herbalists, for example, because they could not afford doctors. Uh, groups of friends would often form friendly societies, as they called them. These friendly societies would collect small weekly contributions from their members and then lend them out or make grants to their members for funerals, for sicknesses, and for unemployment. Some of the friendly societies were pure savings clubs, where members saved throughout the year towards a holiday outing or towards the cost of Christmas good cheer. As a matter of fact, my father belonged to one back in the 1940s. And that's where our Christmas turkey money came from when I was a boy. There was a social side of camaraderie and uh, fellowship and conviviality to these friendly societies. And many held their meetings, including my father's, in the local pub. Does it all sound familiar to you? Yes. Except that we talk of Vinyangas and burial societies and stockfells and shabins. And then there were the pawnbrokers. They'd give you a small loan if you left some article of clothing or a watch or a clock or your best teapot or whatever in their custody. A Lady Bell, in fact, writes of poor women who would pawn their underwear in order to keep up a respectable appearance outside. I'm not quite sure how that works, but maybe you ladies will be able to tell us. Uh, she tells of a woman who regularly took her husband's best clothes to the pawnbroker every Monday uh, to secure a loan for three shillings and sixpence. And every Friday, just in time for the weekend, his best suit came out again for four shillings. Now that's an interest rate of several hundred percent 
not very far off the 25% per week commonly charged here by our illegal money lenders, illegal because of statutes, uh, which are called machinisa. That's the term used. Uh, all my black friends know that. I must explain to s perhaps some of the whites. Machinisa is a well-known illegal money lender in South Africa, and there will be one in every office or factory in this country, at least. Uh, often an employee who runs a sideline business lending to other employees between pay packets. Uh, there are a few also operating on a full-time basis. And they turn over hundreds of millions of rands every year. Now, because of the high administrative costs for the pawnbroker or the machinisa attached to very small loans, their high interest rates are not, in fact, necessarily unfair. At any rate, the customers don't complain because most of them have regular customers, repeat customers. Lady Bell also talks of the unfailing kindness and generosity of poor people. How if a family is down on its luck, a gathering will be held at work and the hat will be passed round and poor people will put in whatever little they can afford. Uh, often in this way funeral expenses would be paid because then as now a decent funeral was expensive but very important. In fact one recent widow in those days was proud to announce that she had buried her husband with ham. What she meant was that they had ham sandwiches of the finest quality uh, for those who came to the funeral. It was important. I don't think the world's poor have changed very much in the way they go about things. Very similar practices to those I've described in England a hundred years ago go on today in South Africa. <coughs> but those who now control South Africa's great financial institutions have forgotten what it is like to be poor, or perhaps they never knew. At any rate, their grand buildings are seldom make poor people feel comfortable. Nor do you find those buildings where poor people live. And neither their procedures nor often their staff are user friendly to those who are less sophisticated than they are themselves. Now years ago they used to overcome this kind of problem by using agents who came from, who knew and who lived in and who spoke the languages of the communities of their customers. But now there are neither banks nor agencies in squatter camps or rural settlements. And so we have the marvels of modern electronic banking for poor people who have no electricity. <coughs> but there are the unsung and largely unknown heroes in South Africa with small innovative mini lending schemes. The pioneer is Mrs. Lynn Anderson with the Get Up Fund she established initially with her personal money five years ago. She makes unsecured loans to poor people uh, from 25 rands upwards in very exceptional circumstances to 3,000 rands. She makes them for wealth generating projects, not for consumption uh, borrowing. And on a very small but fast revolving fund, she so far helped around 3,000 disadvantaged entrepreneurs to get going. Her loans are administered by local agents, which she calls coordinators who know the borrowers and can assess their integrity, no security, their integrity. 
In fact, Mrs. Anderson says there are only two kinds of borrowers. The first has from the very beginning no intention of ever repaying the skellums. Uh, the other kind will repay, although unforeseen events may delay repayment. And she and her get-up fund are learning to distinguish the one from the other. Now, again, through Mr. Andrew Lecaley of the National Stockfells Association, some of the many thousands of South African stockfells, the local friendly societies, are now lending to and investing in business activities. Some small business chambers at the local level also operate revolving loan funds. So does the Get Ahead Foundation which had some early difficulties, but it's now discovered a successful formula by lending not to individuals, but to small groups who are jointly responsible for payment. And this idea of lending to small groups is the method used too by a truly remarkable organization called the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh. It was founded in 1976 by Professor Mohammed Yunus as part of a research project he was then working on based where he was at Chittagong University. Today, this bank has half a million customers, borrowers, 82% of whom are women, it has more than 500 branches serving at least 10,000 villages in Bangladesh. It lends out something like 7 million rands a month. And the average size of the loan is something like 175 rands each. Its recovery rate is 98% and it makes a small profit. Now, Professor Yunus is adamant that credit should be regarded as a human right. That's what he says. He deprecates the notion that credit should be the exclusive privilege of the rich because it's only the rich who've got the securities to provide the conventional collateral. In fact, he uses very strong language. Uh, he says if, if collateral alone can provide the basis for the banking business, then society should mark out the banks as harmful engines for creating economic, social, and political inequality by making the rich richer and the poor poorer. Uh, the same thought was touched on this morning. Strong stuff, but I've heard uh, over many years, uh, particularly at meetings of small black business people, similar comments. Uh, in fact, 15 years ago, one of the black members of the company's pension committee, of which I was then the chairman, uh, challenged me at one meeting of the pension committee. He said, how is it that our money goes into the pension fund, but very little, if any, of the investments of the pension fund go into our areas? And I had no answer then, and I wouldn't have much of an answer even now. But Eunice is equally strongly of the view that handouts are not the solution. He says credit without strict discipline is nothing but charity, and charity in the name of credit will destroy the poor, not help them. Thus, credit institutions must make sure that any loans get paid back in full and in due time. The Grameen Bank has succeeded where so many others have failed because it works with poor people, not for them. When Grameen wants to open a branch in a village, it sends two people from its staff to the village, but not with pomp and ceremony. They find accommodation in an abandoned building or a local government office, they cook their own food, and they walk. 
and they walk and they walk and they walk for several days meeting the people poor people in those villages discussing their needs with them and explaining the way the bank works now as strangers young men with university degrees in the village they're initially under a great deal of suspicion what do these young men want especially as they seem to be talking mostly to the women folk of the village <laughs> uh, what's their hidden agenda gradually trust builds up and the villagers ask them to open a branch they won't open a branch unless they're invited by the people they will not refute they will not impose themselves on people and they're not in any great hurry to make loans they will only lend to groups of five but they won't form those groups of five the people must do it themselves the first loan they make is very small but as the group demonstrates its discipline in repaying it larger loans become available as the process of wealth creation begins they encourage their customers to begin to save however humble the amounts may be and today three quarters of the bank shares are owned by its customers the very same poor people uh, professor Eunice makes several other strong points I didn't know my wife was going to be in the audience when I wrote this but now I'm stuck so I'll have to give it to you anyway this is one of the points he mentions Given an opportunity to fight against hunger and poverty, a poor woman turns out to be a more natural and stronger fighter than a poor man. There, I've said it. <laughs> uh, another point he makes, mixing up the poor and the non-poor is a sure path to failure. Pick up fresh young people to run the program, he says. To have previous experience of any kind always distracts people from grameen type work. Interesting. Always start in a very low key and small way and go as slowly as you can. And lastly, and I like this one, he says a problem is only a half truth. A problem and its solution makes up the whole truth. Discover the whole truth. If you don't find the solution to a problem, it's because you don't understand the problem. So building on that last comment, I'd like to suggest that the, there are solutions to the problem of providing credit to the poor. And if we can't see the solutions yet, it's because we don't understand the problem. Uh, solutions that are already working both here and overseas seem to have some common characteristics and I've just listed a few of them first of all relatively high interest rates are not the problem and therefore subsidized interest rates aren't the solution uh, frequently the need for a small loan for a very short period for a business purpose and you can earn far more than the little interest for that little space of time even if the per annum interest rate is quite high second one I've noted down the lending and saving methods spontaneously developed by poor people themselves have stood the test of time and are common throughout the world solutions will build on these spontaneous solutions not destroy them Third, credit delivery systems must be fast and cheap. They must be available right where the target customers are. The bank's men on the spot must be empowered to make the final decision to lend or not to lend. The man on the spot must know and be part of the borrowing community. Faceless loan committees in distant places have no role in the solution. Poor people have no conventional collateral therefore conventional collateral has no role in the solution a history of personal integrity or personal guarantees offered within a small self-selected group or pawnbrokers pledges 
are fully adequate substitutes for conventional collateral. A perception that poor people are high risk, and it was even mentioned here today, a perception that poor people are high risk is part of the problem. The fact is they're not high risk, and that's part of the solution. Borrowing and thrift go together. Both require discipline. <coughs> Where hard heads do more good than soft hearts. And finally, I regret to have to say this also, whatever archaic customs and marriage laws may have said, our women are a greater part of this solution than are we men. So what stops the poor from borrowing? Originally, I think the economic structures which the privileged designed to protect their privileges. Today we can add a further reason. The privileged don't know who the poor are, nor how they live. They have difficulty finding a solution because they don't understand the problem. In other words, those who are educated need educating in order to help those who had no chance of education. But perhaps that's expecting too much. I think our solution may come the other way round. I think as it was with the friendly societies in England from which stemmed savings banks, life assurance companies, building societies, co-ops, trades unions, adult education structures and so on, I suspect that in the years ahead here new forms of medical and life insurance, building societies, savings banks and so on will emerge from the self-help initiatives of the poor themselves, from the Stockfells and from the burial societies, from the churches and the Shabins. In the Bible, it says, the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. It's time we changed it. It's time we listened and learnt from poor people. Thank you.